sea ice, and we have our sea ice expert here with Cecilia. Can you talk to us a little bit about the basics of sea ice and, and teach us some, of, some information about that? Sure, Kyle. Well, uh, the Arctic Ocean is covered in sea ice year-round over a good portion of the area. Pre-year 2000, that area was about six-tenths the size of the United States. And then in September, the sea ice reaches its uh, minimum, at, and that's when it's six-tenths. But in the maximum extent in winter, it's about 1.6 times the size of the United States. Uh, that area is changing seasonally naturally, and the sea ice thickness is about uh, 3 to 10 feet, so the uh, size of a human is about roughly the uh, depth of the sea ice. The uh, sea ice edge in summer reaches about the uh, edge of the continental shelf, historically. And that um, was, as John was describing, is about the edge of where the uh, ocean productivity is very high. And so that edge is just perfectly aligned with the region that's very use, uh, useful for polar bears uh, at its minimum. And then, of course, at its maximum, it's covering those very productive waters. Uh, this Another feature about the sea ice that I wanted to describe is that it's snow covered, of course in uh, the cold season. So the snow starts to accumulate in the fall, so it's starting to accumulate about now. And it reaches depths of uh, about um, a couple of feet deep, and that's normal conditions. And that's very important because de the polar bear's den in the snow that's uh, captured on the sea ice, especially where the sea ice ridges. So sea ice is very dynamic. It's moving in the Arctic Ocean, and it will ridge and uh, collect snow in these drifts along ridges. Another feature about the snow is that uh, it provides habitat for seals. Seals need the snow depths to be a few feet as well in um, the springtime especially so that they can create caves and in these caves they have their young and as John mentioned this is the favorite food of the polar bear so um, another perfectly timed event where the snow depths reach just the right depth when the seals have their young and then the bears can really take advantage of the uh, seals being above the ocean surface in that season. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand it off again now, and uh, okay. Kyle will. Well, tell you, you know that that's a that's a great perspective on the ice itself. So, um, can you then, Eric, can you talk to us a little bit about the basics of climate change? Because um, I think that'll be important when we try to put this together as what are the impacts of that. Sure. Um, I would prefer to start with a discussion of um, what establishes mean climate, uh, because I think that's an important part of the story that people tend not to cover in, say, newspaper articles or other, co or other coverage of the topic. Um, I'd say starting in about the beginning of the 1800s, scientists started to think kind of seriously mm -hmm. and critically uh, about the question of what determines the mean temperature of a planet. You forget about climate where you happen to live or in a particular location on that, on that planet, but in general we know that we live on a pretty nice planet and uh, it has a very um, congenial climate for supporting life and supporting for supporting us and you could ask well what factors are what are the factors that determine the climate of the planet and make it hospitable to us uh, so when people started thinking about this they realized pretty quickly that uh, to understand the mean climate of, of, a, of a planet uh, you're really asking the question about how energy comes into that planet and how energy uh, leaves the planet in order to cool the planet so you might think that, well, in order to have a habitable planet, you'd want it to be a certain distance from the sun, because that way you'd get just the right amount of sunlight, because it's the sunlight that provides the energy that warms the world and makes it habitable. But of course, if you really want to understand temperature, you have to understand not only how the heat energy gets comes into the system, but you also have to understand how the heat energy leaves the system. And in the case of the Earth, what we know is that uh, energy leaves the Earth by the radiation of infrared radiation, which depends on the temperature of the planet. And therefore, when the planet is warm, it emits more infrared radiation, and that cools it off. And so we reach an equilibrium temperature for the planet. The issue, uh, and one thing I could say about that, um, um, before we get into a discussion of climate change, is that uh, 
in order to understand how much energy is leaving the planet, you need to know the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. You need to also know what those greenhouse gases are. The most important greenhouse gas for the mean climate of the planet is water vapor. Uh, and that water vapor has a trapping effect uh, and it, 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 it reduces the amount of infrared radiation leaving the planet and therefore it causes a warming of the planet. It's not just water vapor. Carbon dioxide is also a very important greenhouse gas. Uh, and the, the, the combination of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere is sufficient to warm the mean climate of the planet by something like 33 degrees cent centigrade. So what that means is that without those greenhouse gases, we wouldn't be able to live on Earth because you wouldn't be able to have uh, unfrozen water. And of course, if all the water on Earth froze, then you'd see a really icy, shiny surface, and that would reflect back even more radiation sunlight to space, and that would cool the planet uh, in addition. So greenhouse gases are good, but the issue is that too much of a good thing is not a good thing. Um, and if you look at the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, uh, and we can do this because we have ice cores that show us what the carbon dioxide concentration has been going back at least hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, and pre-industrial concentrations of carbon dioxide are something like 270 parts per million. Today's level of carbon dioxide is more like uh, 390 parts per million. So we've gone right up. We've really shot up on the amount of carbon dioxide there is in the atmosphere. Is and there a way you could explain that to give that perspective of, of that number change? Uh, well, um, <laughs> sorry, asking questions from the no. viewers. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, uh, and Cecilia might be able to help me out with this, I think in, a, in an ice age cycle you might see a difference of carbon dioxide, you might see carbon dioxide ranging from maybe 180, 190 parts per million to 270 parts per million. And that ice age cycle takes place over, from the maximum temperature to the minimum temperature, takes place over something like uh, 20,000 years, I think. It's Two, been, yeah, yeah. been 20,000 years since the last uh, big ice, big, big deep freeze. Um, so that's a couple tens of thousands of years to go from 190 to 270 parts per million. Over the last, say, 100 years, we've gone from maybe 270 to 390 parts per million. So more than what you would expect over a 20,000 year period, something like that. So it's mm -hmm. a really big change and it's happening really fast. It's happening at a speed that it would not naturally be able to occur at. Um, and going along with that, we do see increases in the temperature of the Earth. Uh, over the 20th century, the temperature of the Earth has increased by something like um, eight-tenths of a degree Celsius. That's in uh, roughly a hundred years. Uh, to give you some perspective, an ice age cycle has a temperature change of about five degrees Celsius. So one-fifth of an ice age cycle occurring mm. over the space of a century, that's what our climate record shows us. If you look at projections of how climate is likely to change over the 20th century, we're looking at maybe another two degrees Celsius change. So if you add that up, you're at something like, you know, 50% to maybe two-thirds of an ice age cycle happening over the course of two centuries. Two centuries instead of 20,000 years, wow. something like that. So it's big. It, it really is a big difference in the, in the climate of the Earth, uh, you know, that since we've, what we've experienced over, say, you know, the time period when um, people have been living, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the Industrial age. Industrial revolution, um, and, mm -hmm. and even, you know, over the period in which human civilization has existed on Earth. Interesting. And thank you for the question. Here's a little reminder. If you do have questions, because we understand that these are complex topics, we encourage you to ask those. You can, again, submit those to questions at pbears.org, or, again, submit those in the chat window, because we're going to have a little bit of time coming up so that we can answer those questions. Um, Thank you for the explanation, Eric, of, of climate change. So let's let's bring this back full circle, kind of where we started. How does climate change impact the sea ice? That's my first question, kind of for Cecilia. And then after you answer that, Cecilia, maybe John, you can get into okay, if it Im makes those impacts on sea ice, therefore there's definitely a chain of consequences for the polar bears that live here. Right. Well, we've been observing the sea ice quite accurately from space, from satellites, for the last 33 years. And that record shows us a very steep decline, especially in September, so during the summer season. 
it's declined by about uh, 33 percent, so about 1 percent per, uh, per year or 10 percent per decade. Now, the last six years have all uh, been the lowest six years on record. So uh, the two that shattered the record, two years that shattered the record previously were 2007, and then again this year, 2012, is now the lowest year ever. And now, as I mentioned earlier, it used to be that we had the ma minimum extent of the sea ice reaching just roughly the continental edge, and now it's much, much less than that. So we're exposing huge areas of the Arctic Ocean that had never been exposed before this century. Uh, as far as we know, when we had ships in the Arctic prior to the satellite record, it's pretty obvious that those areas were not open. And they're uh, quite a long ways from the continental shelf, those very productive waters. So that pushes the ice edge and the pol polar bears that remain on the sea ice far into these very low productivity waters. Uh, so the other element of this I wanted to mention is the future. What kind of extent do we expect in the future? And again, it's that summer sea ice that's shrinking the fastest. And uh, so if we just look at that as an index of climate change in the Arctic, it looks like we'll probably lose Arctic sea ice according to climate model projections sometime this century, probably about mid-century, although the projections have a very wide range that start as early as about a decade or two from now and go to about as late as to the 20, end of the 21st century. So why don't you tell us now about what this really means for polar bears, John? Sure. You know, so there's a couple... There's a couple problems with trying to understand uh, what's happening with polar bears right now and what's going to happen in the future. It's estimated that the current world population, like I said, is around 20 to 25,000 polar bears. Um, but what we don't know is in a lot of places of the Arctic exactly how many polar bears are there now and how many were there say 10 or 20 years ago. And that's because the Arctic is just generally very inaccessible. It's very hard to do work there. So for example, in a lot of places in the Arctic, such as northern Russia, um, there's a lot of polar bears there. We, we know that there's a fair amount of them, but we don't know exactly how many and we don't have historical records to be able to point to. Um, oh, this is fantastic. We're getting another shot of the bears right outside our window here. That's amazing. I mean, right there, we're that close. We sure are. Um, you know, I'm going to break off from my point just for just for a second here to point out. So we're pretty darn close to the coast, and what you see here in Hudson Bay at this point is that these bears are coming down to the coastline. They're hanging out right on the water's edge, and they're waiting for that ice. Bears are pretty long-lived creatures. Um, in the zoos, I believe, in zoos and captivity, I believe I've seen records of polar bears living up to 42 years old. Um, but in the wild, you're probably not going to see a male or a female for that, for that matter. That's going to be much older than 25, possibly 30 years. I believe that the females would probably live a little bit longer in the wild. So a lot of these bears, so bears live quite a long time, and they have a good memory. So they have been through this process before. They've been through the annual loss of sea ice. They've been through its return. So they know that sea ice is coming back. So that's why they've come down here to the coast. They're waiting for that ice to come back because they are more at home on the ice than anywhere else. So they're very excited to get back out there and you can even see them being real active. We were talking about this earlier today. You would suspect that because they're on shore and they don't have any seals to eat, they might just want to lay around and conserve their energy. But you know, it seems that they know that ice is coming back. They know that they're going to have a meal coming up soon. So that's what they're waiting for. Um, but as I was saying before, there's a lot of places in the Arctic where we don't have a good uh, sense of historical records of the population number. There are a couple places where we do, and here in western Hudson Bay is the few, one of the few places where we really do know how many bears there were 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and we know that this population has seen a substantial decline, over 20 percent. And we also know that that is uh, very closely correlated with the loss of sea ice in this part of the Arctic. So where we do have records, the record suggests a strong correlation between the loss of sea ice and a polar bear population decline. In other places in the Arctic, everything we look at about, a por about polar bear ecology, about their evolution, about their physiology, it all points to a very strong relationship in which bears need sea ice to hunt the seals. And they need that sea ice to be where the seals are. They need it to be over the continental shelves. They need it to be over productive water. So when we look at the loss of sea ice around the Arctic, we can say with a fair amount of certainty that as we lose that sea ice, we're going to lose those bears because we don't think they can make a living any other way other than beat out on the sea ice. Great. Thank you very much. And these, these images, um, I think really helped to paint that story as the folks have been seeing um, mm -hmm. as you guys have been talking. So, um, of course, 
sometimes the message can come across dire, but there are definite ways that we can help. In fact, we know um, that the human connection is so important, right? That this is all uh, tied together and even uh, woven together. So what are some ways that we could help? And maybe, John, you could get us started. Mm -hmm. um, to share with people, yes, they, these are the realities of the situation. However, we know that you can make an impact, and by spreading awareness, mm -hmm. what what could they do? Mm -hmm. So, on you know, these kind of considerations about the future and what's going to happen, and uh, what's the potential to actually make a difference at this point, I'm actually really optimistic because I think we're seeing a big change across society right now. It wasn't that long ago that talking about uh, polar bear conservation, talking about climate change, talking about the loss of sea ice, it was a little bit more of a specialist issue, or it wasn't as well understood, it wasn't um, known to really be a mainstream concern. And these days I really think it is. Now there's a lot that has to happen in the future, we have a long ways to go, but we can't even get started on it until everybody is at least thinking about it. So in that regard, I'm pretty optimistic and happy to say that it seems to me more and more people are becoming aware of the, the fact that there are consequences to this really carbon intensive lifestyle that uh, modern society generally leads and um, more aware of uh, the opportunity to make choices to mitigate some of those consequences. So that's, uh, that's kind of my starting point for being optimistic about the future. Uh, I'm optimistic because I'm very interested and in, um, hopeful that we can develop green technologies that uh, can um, help us to uh, tackle this problem without always asking us, our, uh, each of us to give up something. So I, I think that uh, if we can um, see these resources diverted to developing green technologies and green energy, uh, I think we'll all have a better chance of enjoying the future in an energy um, uh, sensible way. Um, and I would add to that that uh, there are two issues that one would logically want to tackle. One is um, finding ways of generating energy without adding to the greenhouse gas concentration of the atmosphere. Uh, but another is um, making sure, considering the consequences of generating that energy, that you use every last drop of that energy as efficiently as you can. Um, so I think uh, conservation is certainly in my mind as important as looking for new sources of energy. And, and conservation can mean a number of things. I mean, it can be as simple as changing a light bulb. Uh, it could be more elaborate in terms of thinking about what your actual energy profile is. How much energy do you spend on heating your house versus transportation? How far do you live from your job? Um, what can you do to um, make sure that your house is uh, more energy efficient and therefore actually more comfortable and less drafty? Um, so I think there are lots of ways that uh, uh, you know, the people are thinking about what to do in terms of conservation and lots of steps that individual people can take. You know, and along those lines, that reminds me of one thing that I always kind of forget off the bat with this issue, is that um, it doesn't all have to be a uh, discussion about sacrifices by any means. You know, there's a lot of ways to make your energy consumption much more efficient, which will actually save you energy because you're not paying then for energy that you're not using anyway. Um, and then you can actually save money and uh, benefit your own lifestyle as well as reduce your impact on the environment. So there's a lot of ways that don't necessarily even have to involve a sacrifice right off the bat. One of the examples that always comes to the front of my mind are adjustable thermostats that allow you to set your heat. If you live in a cold, uh, uh, cold environment, you can set your heat to be a little bit lower at night and then a little bit lower during the day if nobody's at home while you're at work. So it's a way to reduce your energy consumption without having it uh, have any negative consequences or without having you have to feel like you have to make any hard choices. You know, I live in the, the, the Washington, D.C. area, and you say in cold climates, but that works just as well right. when it's really warm <laughs> outside, and you can do that for the thermostat with the air conditioner as well. Right, right. <laughs> so great points. Of course, we know that Polar Bears International has a, a whole lot of programs and resources on the website available, like their No Idle Toolkit and things like that that you can take advantage of as well. So we, of course, we'll talk a little bit more about that, and we would encourage you to explore their resources as well. Um, we're about at the question time frame. So again, if you have questions, 
questions at pbears.org, and we're going to be able to go back and forth with each of the panelists to answer those. And then, of course, if you are on uh, the My Planet My Part website and you're viewing this webcast, there's a live chat feed there. And so feel free to post those questions right there, and we'll be able to uh, ask e each of the panelists as well. So is there anything, as we've been talking panel, and while those guys are submitting their questions, is there anything that maybe uh, kind of struck you that someone else said that you wanted to bring up or mention or uh, a story about what we're talking about that can help to make it su convey such an important message? You know, one of the things that was uh, I was thinking, especially as uh, uh, the two experts here next to me were talking, is that one of the reasons I so enjoy studying polar bears and I so enjoy reading about them and learning more about their science is that it's not just about the species by any means. To, in order to really understand anything about the physiology or the ecology of polar bears, you really have to uh, pretty quickly get into uh, more broad scale ecological concepts, get into things like physical oceanography, get into climatology, and get into a, uh, uh, a whole variety of things about them a whole variety of ways to understand the natural world. So they really are a portal to understand a lot of different things, um, which make them a fascinating topic to learn about and a fascinating topic to study. And I guess I would add to that that um, there's a tendency for people to think that because of the dependence of the global economy on um, fossil fuels and because of the rising of um, global mean temperature and because of the loss of sea ice that the picture is so bleak that there's nothing you can do. Uh, and there is recent research that suggests otherwise that in fact it's not too late to save the polar bear as a species. Um, that steps that we take now if we were able to reduce the rise of global mean temperature then that would in fact preserve some sea ice and some polar bear habitat and enable the species to persist. Um, there's always a lot of talk about tipping points. Well, maybe we've passed the tipping point, and if we pass the tipping point, then the Arctic sea ice is going to go away no matter what we do. It's a very fatalistic kind of argument. Um, as far as we've been able to determine, uh, there are no known tipping points in the Arctic sea ice, and there's nothing that would prevent us from um, being able to conserve sea ice by reducing um, and at some point stopping the rise of global mean temperature. Great, thank you. We do have some questions coming in. I think we're going to focus back on that end of the table between Eric and Cecilia. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the questions here, can you talk a little bit about the difference between Arctic ice, where we are here, and some of the shots that they're seeing out there, uh, and Antarctic sea ice? And then, again, relative to global warming. I can take that one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the Antarctic is a little bit distinct from the Arctic in that most of the sea ice, much more of the sea ice there is seasonal. So it almost all melts away in summer. And that's just normal. It has been like that as long as we know. Uh, another really interesting difference between the Arctic and the Antarctic is that Antarctic sea ice is not dis decreasing in extent. Uh, in fact, it's ex increasing and uh, probably even significantly so over the last uh, 33 years, the satellite era that I mentioned earlier. And that's a puzzle in some ways for climate research because you'd think, well, global warming will have roughly the same effect on both poles, but there are many other reasons why it might not be quite that simple. One is that there's ozone depletion, and it actually does have a small climate impact in the Antarctic. And the Antarctic uh, Ocean is just geometri geometrically is very different. It's a continent surrounded by ocean, whereas the Arctic Ocean is an ocean surrounded by continents. The Southern Ocean is in, um, in much lower latitudes relative to the Arctic. And uh, the sea ice there is further equatorward. It's under roaring winds, just dynamically much more active. And the ocean mixes more deeply there, so you might expect warming to be slower. Um, so, do you want to add anything, Eric? I'm, this, I, I wouldn't want to pretend that this is my area of expertise, but I guess the one thing that sort of always fascinated me about the Arctic is, um, as I understand it, if you go underneath the surface of the ocean uh, at depth, there is actually warm water down there. Yes. And what you could ask is, if there's warm water in the ocean below the surface, then why is there ice in the Arctic that can persist for five or even ten years on the surface? And uh, the answer to that, as I understand it, is that the Arctic surface waters are very fresh. And you realize that, well, fresh water 
weighs less than salty water, and so there's this layer of fresh water, and it's separating the ice on top from the warm water underneath. And that, to me, is just a fascinating idea, that if, all of, if you were to sort of mix, if, if, if the waters of the Arctic were well mixed, you might not see sea ice that persists for many years, because mm -hmm. the surface would be warmed by this current of you know, water coming in at depth that's actually warm. Mm -hmm. So the, the intricacy, the, 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 the number of things that all come together to produce this Arctic sea ice climate that's so essential for polar bears and that they've evolved to, um, it's really a fascinating subject. For sure. Right. We have another question here on the bears topic. Mm -hmm. um, knowing that, that uh, their time that they're eating, you know, is getting pulled per further and further apart, and you can speak better than I can on mm -hmm. this, um, but what is it that they're being forced to perhaps try to survive on while they're in this environment during warmer months? Mm -hmm. I guess that's for um, you, John. Sure, I have <laughs> some answers for that. <laughs> um, so while polar bears are on shore, uh, there's a variety of evidence out there, and there's been a variety of observations indicating that, um, for example, polar bears might eat fish, they might eat bird eggs, they might eat actual birds or nestlings. Um, but all of those observations that have been reported, they've been reported exactly because they're so rare. So, for example, there's um, one recorded observation in the peer-reviewed scientific literature of a polar bear um, successfully fishing and catching fish here in the mouth of a river right on the coast. And that was reported because it was so unique, because polar bears just generally don't do that. Um, so while they're on shore, they are around other animals, but um, maybe the most important point is that there are no other animals on shore that can come close to providing the amount of seals, or I'm sorry, providing the amount of calories that a seal provides. And so even though there are things here on shore for them to eat, there um, is not nearly enough uh, of... Um, there's not nearly enough of an energy intensive food resource on shore for them to eat. Another thing that they will consume here on shore is vegetation and actually we've been seeing some of these bears out here chewing on willow and kind of pulling up some grass from the ground and that kind of thing but that again is not really going to provide much in the way of nutritional benefit. Um, without going too far into the science behind it, there's been a fair amount of research that has looked for chemical tracers of food sources from either the aquatic environment or the terrestrial environment. And when you take samples from shores here, uh, I'm sorry, from bears here on the shore of Hudson Bay during this time of year, um, you can look at uh, a variety of their tissues and you'll see only tracers uh, called stable isotopes. You'll see only tracers from the aquatic environment. So that means that what bears are living off of at this time of year is stored fat that they accumulated in the spring when they were deriving nutrients from seals which are based in the aquatic environment. So even though they're here on shore, they're just not making a living here. Interesting, okay. Um, there's some questions from, from the folks paying attention and joining us. Um, you, you've all kind of spoken a lot about data and we know that you know your content, um, but what is the difference between data and models? Mm -hmm. Is there a difference and can you speak to that? Hmm. And I'll free for all. Take the first <laughs> shot at it, Cecilia. <laughs> okay, uh, well both Eric and I work a lot with models. Uh, I personally think that models create data when they um, produce output, but there's some people really object to the term data used for anything else other than observation. So it's kind of a debate, but I don't think it's a very meaningful one. Uh, I think maybe more what you're asking in this question is, you know, how do we use models to understand the environment and perhaps even uh, to model the uh, energetics of polar bears, which you probably know a little bit about too, John. Yes, yeah. <laughs> uh, so we create climate models from the basic laws of physics about conservation of energy, like Eric was describing in terms of the planetary energy balance. Conservation of mass, really simple principles, you know, they're very basic ideas, very classical physics. And the, those equations are well established, but then there are other things we have to bottle that we don't have very good equations for, like the very small intricacies of turbulence in the atmosphere, clouds, and even things like sea ice, um, kind of challenge those scales that are really more appropriately measured at the um, uh, resolve scale. And so we do have things called parameterizations that uh, are based on what we do uh, model in a, and then the, we have to in turn relate those to the things that we want to know like turbulence and sea ice growth. And, uh, so we put all this together and we can model the past to see how well we do, compare it to the 20th century time history, sea ice extent, things like that. And uh, they do well. 
And then we model the feature, and that's our basis for projections. Want to add anything to that? Um, well, I, I work at a science funding agency, uh, and so when we fund science, we tend to think of um, science that involves uh, observations, science that involves uh, modeling studies and simulations, um, and uh, somewhere along the line there has to be a concept of um, increasing our understanding of the physical system. That's really the goal, and for, uh, you know, we're very fortunate in the, in the sense that we live in an era where there are lots of sources of observational data. For sea ice, um, understanding the, the concentration of sea ice in the Arctic and in Hudson Bay and the Antarctic, we have satellites that have been orbiting the globe, um, um, a succession of satellites that look at microwave emissions from the surface and they tell you whether or not the, uh, there's open ocean water or whether there's sea ice. That's a record that extends back to 1979. We have temperature records from thermometers at the surface that go back um, at least a couple hundred years in some places. Uh, and we have just a variety of different ways of observing what the climate is doing, what the atmosphere is doing, what the ocean is doing. Um, but understanding the system is more than just observing it. To understand the system uh, using a scientific method, you use your observations to formulate hypotheses. And you can use observations to test hypotheses, but it turns out that models are an excellent way of testing hypotheses. Because you could take your understanding of the physical laws of nature that you think are operating in the system, the most important physical processes, things like that, you can make a model of those processes. We have very nice computers that you can run those on, and you can test hypotheses. So one of the hypotheses that's been tested over and over and over again is the hypothesis that adding greenhouse gases to the atmosphere of the Earth warms the planet. And so I think as a scientific enterprise, um, we develop great certainty from these experiments that we understand the physical system and we understand in a broad sense how it's going to respond to increases in greenhouse gases. Uh, there's another activity that's done with models which is a little bit different from science and that's making projections, trying to give guidance to policymakers as to what you might expect will be the consequences of adding greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. And to some extent I think that's where the uncertainties that Cecilia was talking about really come into play. That a lot of people wish that we could give them a very precise answer. Okay, if we double carbon dioxide, exactly how much is global mean temperature going to increase? And if we keep on adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere at the rate that we're doing, exactly tell me what's the year when the Arctic is going to first become ice-free in summer? Uh, and it turns out that those kinds of precise questions that policymakers would like to know the answers to are always going to have error bars on them. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the science, and it doesn't even mean that there's anything wrong with the models. It just means that there's a, there are limits to what you can say about the future. And you know, one thing that occurs to me as they're talking, and that I, I would add to that, is that um, it's not just climate science. Uh, the, the exercise of modeling in any field, for example, even talking about the level of an organism, we're looking at these shots of the bears outside, and we're thinking, for example, how many calories is that, bur is that bear burning right now as he's sitting there and sniffing in the willows and laying on the snow? Well, there's a lot of different variables that you could consider. You could consider how much heat he's losing to the air. You could consider how much heat he's losing to the ground. You could consider the amount of calories he has in stored fat, the amount of calories he has in stored protein. You could consider his movement. And there's basically in any situation, there's almost an endless, if not endless, list of variables that you could include. And you're never going to have a precise understanding of each one of those variables. You're never going to have complete knowledge of a system. And so what you do is a lot of background work to identify the most important components that will give you the best possible answer to the system, given the constraints of never being able to know everything there is to know. So even when you're trying to model, for example, just the uh, behavior or the metabolic rate of an individual organism, you're doing modeling as well, and there's going to be a certain amount of imprecision, and there's going to have to be error bars put on that as well. And put on that as well. But it certainly doesn't mean that um, you don't have a good understanding. It just means that uh, the modeling that you're doing is never going to be perfect. Thank you. Um, here's an interesting question, and kind of getting off that topic, which you guys are very passionate about, and it's great. Um, but Back towards way in the beginning, we were, Johnny, we were talking a little bit about polar bears and brown bears, and mm -hmm. uh, 
Jessa, I hope I get your last name correct, but Jessa Barzillay, an education supervisor at the San Francisco Zoo, she's mm -hmm. really wondering, are polar bear and brown bear um, ranges, are they overlapping as the sea ice declines? And is that, are there any kind of impacts from a global warming standpoint there? Mm -hmm. So that's a great question. Um, so polar bears and brown bears, um, one thing I'll put out there because it might be on people's minds, they can indeed hybridize. It's happened in the wild and it's happened in captivity as well. But it's very uncommon and um, generally speaking in the polar bear science world, uh, there's a consensus that it probably won't become more common and it's not going to be a very important piece of the future for either one of those populations. One of the main reasons is that um, they don't overlap in habitat during the mating season. So brown bears and polar bears, or um, brown bears, which are also called grizzly bears, um, and polar bears, they uh, both mate in the spring. And even in the worst case scenario right now, in terms of climate modeling and in terms of forecast for what the sea ice is going to look like, there's going to be some sea ice in the spring that polar bears will be out on. And that's where they do their traveling. That's where they do their mating. So polar bears will be out on the sea ice during the spring. They'll be mating with each other. And there aren't brown bears that go very far out onto the sea ice. So even though there are brown bears on the shore and they might interact during the summer, during the mating season, those two species won't be overlapping very much. So hybridization won't be important. Thank you. So for our last question here, as we begin to wrap things up, we really we started here by looking at this fantastic um, uh, climate that, that we're here. We've seen polar bears in the wild. We've seen the ice. We've talked about the ice, the impacts that uh, ice has on polar bears, and then even broader, the impact that greenhouse gases and climate change and global warming have on polar bears. Uh, how do we, uh, here's a great question, how do we or how do each of you as a panel convey the sense of urgency about this topic because it's very important and we want people to know about it um, but without uh, making there a sense of no hope where there's nothing that can be done at all. Mm -hmm. Let's hear if you could boil it down to one last final thought. <laughs> Are you, do you have the choice of panelists you'd like <laughs> to? Free <for> all again. <laughs> I have one that comes to mind right away. Okay. And that is a lot of the things that um, have been expressed here today really indicate that in a lot of ways it's, it's a fairly simple equation. Polar bears are truly dependent on sea ice for hunting seals. And the sea ice is truly dependent upon the climate. And the, one of the biggest drivers in climate is um, uh, the choices that we as a human society make. And so that, that's, uh, that puts a lot of responsibility on us. It truly does. And there are some poor choices that are being made right now, and there really are. But it doesn't mean that better choices can't be made in the future. And so um, I think the sense of urgency is that the polar bear habitat is, is literally melting away. It's like watching an entire continent just disappear right in front of our eyes. But it doesn't have to be that way. And the choices that are causing this are straightforward and they're with us every single day. So every single day is a new opportunity to make um, probably the most important choice you could for polar bears. Great, thank you. Uh, I can add just a little that, as Eric mentioned, there's pretty good research. In fact, my group has done some of it about the sea ice's uh, capable of coming back. If we can turn around global mean temperature uh, to start to either level off and even decline, we expect the sea ice to come back. It's really important for us to do that quickly though before it's too late. So I think the most um, hope I have is that first knowing that and also seeing how energized we are by just talking about this topic and how um, exciting it has been to you know share our ideas and I think you guys can help us with that by uh, you know educating the public and um, spreading the word and talking about this problem amongst yourselves I think that's really uh, the key to uh, solving this problem I would just echo that it's not too late to save the polar bear great thank you very much so we thank you as ambassadors for all the things that you're doing and we're sure you're encouraging um, the folks that you work with for doing things like uh, reducing the amount of time that you're in uh, showers or for uh, eating less meat or for riding bikes and things like that. Of, co of course, these are important concepts. But if you're wondering what else you can do, um, take a look. I had mentioned a little bit earlier about the No Idle Toolkit, which is available to set up no idling zones. Perhaps that's something that you could incorporate and you can encourage folks to incorporate Parade as well um, into their into their habits in their work areas. Uh, in addition, it's a great way to reduce CO2 and a perfect classroom project. So if you have educators that are coming to you, um, have them come onto the website and discuss these ideas with them. 
Speaking of the classroom, we want to encourage you and, and your neighbors and your classrooms and everyone to go ahead and join us for the new My Planet, My Park Community Center on the PBI website. And here's a place where you can join forums and really make a difference for polar bears by sharing photos and videos of the things that you are doing to reduce your carbon footprint. And we think that's really important as we build this sense of community that you can connect with other people as you're all working together towards this common goal. The launch of the, Mo launch rather, of the My Planet, My Part uh, contest includes, uh, or the launch of My Planet, My Part includes a contest and that will run through November 26th can't get my words out here at the end of the show but a grand prize and this is really cool a grand prize is the ability to win um, a trip up here to Churchill so that you can see the impact and that you can see the polar bears as well so take a look at that and in addition if you've been a part of the project polar bear registration process that's now been extended so you have almost a full week we're going into the first week of November uh, to the sixth I believe so form a team um, join up and see what you can do to uh, build a project to reduce your carbon footprint and reduce these uh, these uh, greenhouse gases. And finally, of course, the uh, please visit the Tundra Connections page on our website to take a. Uh, a post broadcast survey we want feedback from you what is interesting what did you like what can we make better as we continue to broadcast here from the tundra lastly our heartfelt thanks go to julian reed an apple distinguished educator and a polar bears international education advisory council member and she directs the tundra connections program and we're very thankful for her and her help on that and to our platinum sponsor, Frontiers North Tundra Buggy Adventures, which is where we are on Tundra Buggy 1 right now. Support has also been provided by Pearls of the Planet, a project of Explore.org, a direct charitable activity of the Annenberg Foundation, and we're grateful to Parks Canada and Tanberg, now part of Cisco Systems. So thank you so much for taking time out of your day. This is, as you can tell from our panelists, we think it's a very important topic, but we really know that you guys are the key players here and you make a difference and the things you do as ambassadors can really help. So thank you for asking your questions and thank you panelists for all of the work that you're doing and being able to relay this information to our group. Thank Certainly. you. Certainly, thank you for watching. Yeah. Take care everyone, thank you so much. Bye now. Bye -bye.